Mark Dwitziak. The latest book is A Mystery of Mysteries, The Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe. So why is Edgar Allan Poe still popular? Well, almost all of the authors who were Poe's contemporaries have disappeared or have lapsed into uh, unpopularity. Even the ones who were wildly uh, popular, he's like, like Longfellow. Longfellow was a superstar in, in, in Poe's time. And who reads Longfellow today? But everybody reads Poe and everybody gets Poe. And one of the reasons is because he is reintroduced year after year on the junior high school level. Everybody gets Poe in curriculum. And that's wonderful. It's, it's a renewable energy source. He's there. The pop culture has certainly done its role in keeping Poe popular, even though the movies often enough have very little to do with Poe and they're hardly the models of fidelity to Poe's stories, they have, in essence, given him a certain amount of street cred, uh, as have all the people who love Poe and have embraced, like the Beatles. I mean, hey, there, he's on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's. He's name-checked in, uh, in a John Lennon song and a Bob Dylan song. He is, uh, he's in The Simpsons and he's in South Park. I mean, how much street cred do you need uh, than that? Who else has that? And he happens to have created the modern horror story and the modern detective story. Well, that gives him a tremendous following with people in, who are interested in a certain type of literature. He is a patron saint to two fairly major literary genres. He, he should be, actually, the patron saint of even more, but that's enough. Now, what about Poe appeals to you personally? I first attracted to Poe the way I think a lot of people are. Was a, I was a seven-year-old horror fan in the 1960s, so the, I, I sought out, um, it was actually Scholastic Books, had the Scholastic Books catalog, they had uh, 10 Great Mysteries by Edgar Allan Poe, and I, um, I had got this, and then they also had another volume, Eight Tales of Terror. Um, these 18 stories uh, began my kind of love affair with Edgar Allan Poe, and in the, these two volumes are The, the Black Cat, and the Cask of Amontillado, and the Telltale Heart, and the Mask of the Red Death, and that was enough. <laughs> Truly, by junior high school, when I first got Poe in curriculum, I already was a Poe fan. Now, more than almost any writer short of Shakespeare, there are a lot of myths surrounding Poe. What are some of the common misconceptions that people have about him? Well, he, he, the difference between Shakespeare and Poe is the misconceptions that are around, po around Shakespeare are based on a lack of information. There's almost no good record for who Shakespeare was, which has led to endless debate. We, uh, Shakespeare scholars would be thrilled to find a laundry list in his hand. It would completely change our view of Shakespeare if we found just that. Uh, with Poe, it's not a lack of information, it's a plethora of misinformation. And almost right from the start, as when Poe died, and an enemy who he thought was a friend, uh, he, and he had thought would be his literary executor, wrote a, 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 a scandalous obituary and uh, pictured uh, Poe as a degenerate, as a drunkard, as a, uh, somebody who was undependable. And that damage done by that big piece of misinformation really has not been undone to this day. We're, we're still laboring under those uh, misconceptions that started the moment Poe died. The gentleman you're alluding to, Griswold. Ru Rufus Griswold is the, uh, is, is the man. And he, d he not only writes this obituary, he writes several pieces about Poe. He becomes obsessed with uh, doing whatever he can to smear Poe's memory and his legacy. Do we have any hazard as to why Griswold went on a posthumous smear campaign? Certainly jealousy, you know, and, and Poe could have slighted him at one point. Poe was perfectly capable of slighting somebody and almost being unaware of it because his standards were so high and he probably wouldn't have thought somebody should take offense at something he might said that somebody would have taken offense at. And also for a, a brief while they were rivals for the same uh, woman. For, for They both pictured themselves as possible suitors for the same woman. And jealousy, I think, uh, the, I think the primary motivating factor was that Griswold pictured himself as the great uh, arbiter of literary taste. And Poe 
clearly as a critic was that, and then he was his superior as a poet. And I think that Griswold probably, another reason, he probably didn't approve of Poe. And, I, and, and this is something, that, to understand Griswold, you have to understand that most of the poetry that was celebrated and lauded in Poe's time what was, was known as the poetry of uplift, like Longfellow. The mm -hmm. whole idea was that there should be something morally uplifting about the poetry. Poe didn't believe that. Poe did not believe in moral, what, what eventually is going to become the Chautauqua movement, the idea that all of this should be about uplift. Poe runs contrary to do that, and the Chautauqua movement sort of overruns Poe. It delays Poe being taken seriously in his own country. It's not until the 20th century, and people start to see some of the horrors of World War I and the Depression and the different things, that Poe is all of a sudden his writing has a relevance that it didn't have. And we, 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 we catch up with Poe in this country. It takes a while, but we finally catch up with him. And Griswold would not have approved of Poe's lack of moral uplift. So in essence, could Griswold have talked himself into thinking this was a holy crusade to knock this guy down? I suppose he could have. I suppose if you wanted to put the best possible spin on his motives for that, that could enter into it. Now, a lot has been written about Poe. Was it difficult to find a fresh angle to write about him? Um, no, I don't think it was, because I, I hit on it pretty fast. You know, I was very much thought the, the dual timeline was going to be part of the book. And I also thought that using the skills of a journalist, because I was a journalist. I was a journalist for 43 years. And when a journalist does something, they interview people. They go out and they do their research, uh, not only in archives and museums, but also by talking to experts in various fields. Now, that's not the traditional way you write a biography, certainly of somebody who died in 1849. I took that task because I couldn't pretend to be a different kind of writer. I couldn't pretend to be an academic. And I've always fall back on something Stephen King said uh, about his writing when he said that if you do not like the type of things I write, if you have some problem with the horror story or the terror tale or the type of thing that I write, all I can say is it is what I have. And that's what I would say to anybody if, if somebody did not like the chances I took with this, with this book, all I can tell you is, it's what I have. So what do we know, we actually know, about Poe's death? We know he stopped breathing on October 7th, 1849. We know where he stopped breathing, Washington Hospital. We know he was taken there after being found insensible and wearing clothes that were not his own. And we know some of the symptoms. The problem is that the symptoms could have been caused by a staggering number of possible causes. They fit a lot of different things. And that's why it's very easy to have a theory about how Poe died and then bend the evidence around that theory. So um, the problem with, with Poe's death is that we have conflicting witnesses. The attending physician, John Moran, changed his, his, his his testimony on how Poe died. He left three accounts. They are wildly different. Now, this is the one man we need to be accurate and precise in his observations as Poe is dying. He is anything but. And so the one person we sort of turn to for the details of what happened as Poe is dying is totally unreliable. And he even goes so far as to change the time of death Later on, he says, well, it would be much better to have him die at midnight. Well, let's change. We'll make it midnight. He died at midnight. You know, it's, he changes Poe's last words. He, and, and I don't believe either of them are what Poe said as he was dying, by the way. I think they're both, it sounds like, melodramatic claptrap that Poe would have been embarrassed to have had credited as his last words. So I, we also have this, this, this incredible record of conflicting and unreliable testimony as far as, as Poe's death is concerned. And you know, with that, no death certificate, no autopsy. It's, um, you, you, you know, you can only take your best guess. You can only take your best guess on the, on the, on the evidence. So we have a physician with a flair for the dramatic, an executor with an ax to grind. Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like there are too many primary sources we get to work from that are reliable.
said, oh yeah, there's a third, there's a cousin who shows up when Poe is found. They sent for, he shows up. He assumes Poe has been drinking. Now, there's no evidence that Poe had been drinking. There's no witnesses that say Poe was drinking. There was no blood alcohol test taken of any kind. But he had known Poe when Poe had been drinking. So he assumes. It's not a really an unfair assumption in a way, but there's no evidence for it. And then later, this cousin is going to go on the lecture circuit as, guess what, a temperance speaker. So it's to his great advantage to tell an audience, well, Poe died of drink. Beware drink. Beware. See what it did to the great Poe. Everybody in this is compromised in some way. To be fair, Poe loved an unreliable narrator. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But in, in fiction. In fiction. <laughs> so he was found in clothes that were not his own. This directly leads to my next question. What is cooping? Cooping uh, is a uh, practice uh, perfected by the political gangs uh, of the 1830s and 40s, and Baltimore was probably the height of the art because Baltimore is a very rough town, even by th that, that decade's standards. It was a harbor. Any harbor town would have had a very tough district, a very rough district. Baltimore was such a rough town back then, its nickname was Mob Town. And again, these, these people would riot at the drop of a hat, and uh, they took it very seriously. They, 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 they would drive the mayor out and the, sh the sheriff out of town, and they would burn down the houses of bankers and wealthy people. Um, you know, people talk about like riots today and say, oh, this is terrible. It's like, well, read your history. This is actually, you know, <laughs> in some cases it was worse back then. And Poe does get to Baltimore at a time when a, a an election was going on. So the thought is that he might have been shanghaied and turned into a repeat voter, somebody taken from district to district to polling place to polling place to vote several times in the election. Uh, sometimes those people would be made to change clothes so people would not recognize them. And in between times they were kept in pens or coops, if you will, and thus the term cooping came about. It's a very good explanation as for the missing days, as to what happened to Poe, why he went missing. The only problem with it is there's not one shred of evidence except the circumstantial evidence that, yes, he, he would have, the steamer would have taken him to Baltimore where he would disembark, so he would have been in Baltimore. An election was going on, and cooping was practiced. All those things make a very good, strong circumstantial case for cooping being the explanation for the missing days. Also, if Poe was sick when he got to Baltimore, he was not in good shape, it would not have been good for him to have been kept in a, on a cold, wet October days in these cooping cells, and uh, it could have seriously undermined the health of somebody who was already suffering from something. Is there any truth to the insinuations that Poe was depressed or addicted to alcohol or laudanum, or is this all Griswold? Um, yeah, well, well, Griswold was the one who, who put the label of drug addict on him, but Thomas Dunn English, who hated Poe, Thomas Dunn English and Poe came to blows once. They were, were, were they didn't, there was no love lost between them, and, and English hated Poe. And after Poe's death, and Griswold wrote that, that Poe was a drug addict, English was, of all people, came to Poe's defense. He had no reason to, but he said, listen, I observed the guy up close. He never took drugs. It never, and, and there's no record of it at all. He probably did take some drugs here and there that were common in medicines given at the time. That is probably true. So everybody probably took a drug at some time back then. If you looked at the medicine they gave for, for, for uh, laudanum was in a lot of things. Laudanum was prescribed for a lot of things. But there's no record at all of him uh, of being a drug user. Alcohol is clearly a problem for him, but probably not in the way people think. Is that Poe, if the evidence, the record is correct, it took very little alcohol for Poe to get roaring drunk. He could just have a little bit of alcohol and it would look like he'd been drinking for hours. And so, and, th and then he, he paid for it. His system was, was, was devastated by it. It would take him days to get over the effects of, of, of a drinking incident. Poe's, there are long, long periods of sobriety in Poe's life. 
and uh, there's, there, there, we have evidence for it. We have evidence where people who knew him and lived with them would say, I never saw him take a drink in all that time. So there are these long periods of sobriety. Poe's problem is not only that he's probably allergic to alcohol, he also picks the worst possible time to take a drink. It's always at a point where it's going to completely throw him off the track career-wise. So he's, Poe wrote a short story called The Imp of the Perverse. Poe had the imp of the perverse. If you, there are times you just want to reach into the bio, pages of his biography and slap him and say, no, no, not now. No, this is not the time to be picking a fight. This is not the time to be calling this guy a name. This is, or this guy's trying to help you, don't you see? He's just his own worst enemy and, and, and time after time. You know, it's, it's, and you just sometimes get exasperated with him. Poe, you know, he, po, today we would probably call Poe high maintenance, you know, as a friend. I would have loved to have been Poe's friend. I would have loved to have tried to help him. But I think Poe would have been high maintenance, definitely. Yeah. Poe's death, is this a mystery that can ever be resolved? I don't, th for definitively, I don't think so. I, I don't, I'm, and there's part of me that does not want to see it resolved because I think it is part of the romance of our fascination with Poe. Some mysteries are, were not meant to be solved. Um, I, I, I think if, to claim that this can be proved definitively, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I think that would be an irresponsible claim. You know, um, I think there are some things which are obvious candidates for contributing to his death. And I think that makes a very strong circumstantial case. But it's not up to the detective to decide whether to go forward with case. It's up to the district attorney. So I have presented the testimony as best I can. And now it, the reader, in essence, becomes the district attorney. Would you take this to court? Would you take this case to court? You know, that's up to every individual who considers the evidence to decide. Now, you wrote a book called Mark Twain's Guide to Diet and Exercise, Beauty, Fashion, Best Romance, Health, and Happiness. Yes. What would Poe's guide to those things look like? <laughs> what would Poe's guide to diet, exercise, fashion, and happiness look like? Poe liked to dress nice. Poe would have been a very much in, into fashion. If he could have afforded it, Poe would have been a fashion plate. So that, there's that. Poe never had the money to invest, so his, his, his advice on investment would have been worthless. He had, he had no track record of that. Uh, Poe's diet was actually surprisingly good. The tests on his hair show he actually had a lot of seafood. A lot of uh, fresh vegetables, and his diet wasn't as bad as we thought it was for a long time. But health and happiness, and now Poe is a romantic. Uh, there I think he, he comes up very, very high. Poe is a, definitely a romantic. Health and happiness. This is where I think Poe, because Poe believed that health and happiness ultimately lay in intellectual pursuits. At the, in his, the last year of his life, um, he is uh, the, the California gold rush, the 49ers. He dies in 49. The, the gold rush and the, the whole idea of the 49ers begins that year when Poe is on his path that's going to lead him to Baltimore. And he was fascinated by all these people packing up and heading to California. And he wrote a friend that uh, the true riches are health of body and mind, intellectual pursuits, being a writer was basically what he was saying, was this was the true realm of happiness, the, the true dominion of happiness. And he wrote a poem. There's this wonderful return to poetry at the end for Poe, where he writes the bells and Annabelle Lee, and he writes some of his best poems in the last, that last blossoming of talent uh, before his death. And one of the poems he writes in response is El Dorado. And El Dorado, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brief little poem, but it basically talks about, it's, his, it's, his, it's his, what he was saying to his friend about uh, intellectual pursuits and about the journey being more important than the destination. You know, and, and because El Dorado is a, uh, it, it just, very quickly, it's, it's it, gaily bedight a gallant knight in sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long singing a song in search of El Dorado, but he grew old this night so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow fell, as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, 
where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. And the meaning there is if you, if you seek true riches, it's, you'll find it in the journey. You will find it in the, the El Dorado is the city of gold. And that's where everybody's heading. They're heading out west to, to find gold. And what Poe is saying, and what the, the spirit is saying at the end is, it doesn't matter. If you seek for this, ride boldly ride. Thank you. Is there a website where people can learn more about you and what you've written? I have a website, which is very tricky, called markdewitziak.com. <laughs> so that's my author's website, but I'm also on Facebook. You've written several books on topics as varied as The Twilight Zone, Ted Nebo, Roosevelt's Love of Nature. What interests you in a topic enough to research and write a book about it? Well, like Poe, I'm interested in a lot of different things, and I don't like repeating myself. I think that, you know, it's... It, it's I don't like going around the same, even though I've written five books about Mark Twain, they're wildly different books about Mark Twain. So I don't like repeating myself, I like challenging myself. And um, you know, somebody once, I was at, once at a book fair, and there was a table like this with the, uh, several of my books spread out, and a guy, a guy was going by the table and he sort of stopped and did a double take. And he looked and he looked puzzled and he looked at me and then at the books and back at me and he said, I don't get it. And I said, well, what don't you get? He said. I, I, don't, I don't get, what's the common theme here? You know, these, these books are, 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 are all different. This is, you know, The Twilight Zone, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, Dracula, uh, Columbo. What, I, I, and I said, me, I'm the common theme. I wrote all these books because these are all interests of mine. And, you know, I don't confine myself to saying, okay, I'm just going to write about this. There's certain things I'm probably always going to go back to write. There's something in me that does get drawn back to the spooky side of the street, I suppose. And therefore, you know, there's going to be a book about Night Stalker and Dracula and the Twilight Zone. Uh, but I, I, I just, I, I refuse to be confined by, uh, you know, Vincent Price once said, he was not talking about Edgar Allan Poe when he said this, but Vincent Price once said that the person who limits his interests limits his life. Now that's a very good definition of Poe. Poe was interested in everything. And I've always kind of liked that, my, that saying myself. I think you do limit your life if you limit your interests.